Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kara Capoli. I work in the MBA Programs Office. I want to just take a couple of seconds and tell you a little bit about the format of the evening so that you guys are ready to go because you guys are going to be active participants. Uh, the, the session tonight is going to be recorded, which is why you see me holding a microphone. Um, Mr. Steinbrenner is going to talk for a little bit of time, and then he really wants to have an open discussion and dialogue with you all. Uh, which is why we talked about coming be prepared with questions. So we have a couple of students who are prepared to ask the first two questions. And then after that, I ask you to just, after you've had a chance to ask your question, hand it off to the next student, and we'll go from there. So there'll be a, a microphone on each side of the room, and then we'll just pass it to one another, okay? So that is how the format's going to go for the evening. Uh, and after the event, there will be some light refreshments out in the Huff Court. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Kraft, the Dean of the Warrington College of Business, who's going to introduce Mr. Steinbrenner. Thank you, Kara. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Hal Steinbrenner. Hal is a graduate of Williams College. He is also an MBA graduate from here in 1994, and his uh, basic title is General Managing Partner of the New York Yankees, uh, which includes uh, a number of other businesses, the Yes Network, uh, hospitality, hotels, and what he's going to do is talk for a couple minutes, and then he's open to questions, and basically you can ask any questions. If you ask a really stupid question, Carol will lose her job. So, <laughs> you know, and she has two small kids and things like that, so she may not have any other alternatives. So, uh, again, thank you all for coming, and Hal, go right ahead. Hear me? Is it working? Perfect. Okay. Well, I just want to thank all of you guys for the for the opportunity of being here today. When Dean Kraft uh, invited me to come speak to all of you, I told him I was very flattered, but at the same time, I was honest with him. I told him I do not like standing up giving long speeches, uh, primarily because I do not like sitting listening to people give long speeches. So, uh, brevity is the soul of wit. So said Shakespeare, one of my favorite authors. So uh, I tend to keep it brief, and I just kind of feel if you can't get your point across in 10 minutes or less. Uh, you're doing something wrong. But I am very, very glad to be here. Uh, I graduated 20 years ago. Hard for me to believe. A lot of things have changed. There's new buildings. I got lost coming from the parking lot to Bryan Hall because there's new buildings. But um, it, uh, it was a great experience for me, the two years I spent here. I learned a lot. I worked hard. Spent a lot of nights in the library. Um, spent a lot of nights having fun. Uh, places like the Purple Porpoise, which I, I believe is no longer here because I drove down university and I didn't see it, but I'm sure you guys have some place on the weekends you go to, uh, to relieve the stress, so to speak. Uh, it was a great experience. I've been thinking for a couple weeks as I knew I was coming here, trying to figure out what the one biggest thing I took from the two years here was. And I think the biggest thing that I took from this program and being here and going through the courses and the classes was really listening to and valuing the opinions of others. I should have been better at it sooner in life. And I wasn't better at it sooner in life because I was a know-it-all or thought I knew everything. Uh, at age 14, I went to Culver Military Academy in northern Indiana. And those of you that have been through a military academy or in the military know that the first few months of any such program very much sink or swim. And you bond with the fellow people that you're going you know, through the unpleasant experiences with, but at the same time, you're very much responsible for your own stuff. And when you mess up, everybody pays. That's, that's the military way. So you tend to become very, very self-reliant in a hurry, which I did. And that carried over not just to the military and the drills and everything, but even into studying. So when I got to college, Williams College up in Massachusetts, um, people would have study groups. And they would study together and ask each other questions. And for whatever reason, I was uncomfortable with that. And I think I just felt that I could do it myself and should do it myself, my responsibility to do it myself. So I would go to the library, and I would study quite hard, and I would do pretty well. Then I got here, and all of a sudden, they had something called mandatory study groups. I was like, wow, mandatory study groups, OK. Uh, actually having to interact with people and do projects, <laughs> and uh, many of them through many classes through the two years. And it was a great experience. And I, and I realized in a hurry what I was missing out on. I was missing out on a lot of knowledge and a lot of points of view that, uh, that I could have had sooner, and that I probably would have done better in college you know, had, I, had I gone that route. Life right now, I have a very, very good upper management team. 
people, men and women that have been with us for years and years, some of them 25, 30 years. And although I'm the one making the decisions and I have the ultimate responsibility of the decisions I make, I rely on their opinions very, very heavily. And it's very rare that I make a decision without talking to as many people as I can and taking as much time as I can to make that decision. The, uh, the world that you are going to go back into that many of you have already been a part of, I wish I could stand here and say that I think it's significantly better off out there than it was a year or two ago. I don't. Um, obviously, we have a lot of experience dealing with corporations that are sponsors of ours. We talk to our fans. We know how much they're hurting, a lot of them. Uh, we're involved in the hotel business in Florida. I don't see the situation in the hotel business being too much better than it was two years ago. It's not worse. I just don't think things are a ton better. Uh, I don't say this to discourage anyone, um, only to let you know to be prepared. Always good to be prepared. Be strong. Um, work hard. I know all of you do that. You wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't have a good work ethic. Be an optimist. I'm surrounded every day by pessimists. I mean, we all are. We all are. And it wears you down. And to be a pessimist, quite frankly, is easy. To be an optimist is not. Uh, our minor league complex in Tampa, my dad was very fond of hanging up signs everywhere because we have a lot of kids that are 18 years old. We draft them out of high school. Or kids that are 17 years old out of the Dominican Republic. So we always like putting these signs up, famous quotations from, from different people through history. One of my favorites is Churchill, who said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and an, op an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So I would urge all of you, as you go back out into life, some of you, I guess, have not been in the business world yet, from my, my understanding, but I know you graduate MBAs have. Be an optimist. Not always easy. I fail some days, but I, but I certainly try, because when you're in a leadership role, in a leadership position, it's, it's your job to be the optimist. There, there's no other option. There can't be another option. The last thing I wanted to say, which is maybe something you've never heard somebody stand up here and say before, a lot of you are going to be successful. A lot of you sitting in this room are going to be successful through a company that you go to work for or maybe a company you start yourself. As long as you are charitable and you give back to your communities, to society, be proud of that. I sense, and it's my opinion, a growing trend in this country on the part of some to look down on successful people. The events of 2008, the greed that we saw, uh, 2008, 2009, different stories that came about certainly have contributed to that. But there's a lot of very good successful people out there that are giving and that are charitable. And if you are one of those and you find yourself in a position of success, be very proud because you have created jobs, you have created livelihood for other people that otherwise might not have it. And that's, that's a big difference, and that's a great thing. If I had to give you any kind of advice, not that I ever feel like I'm in a position to give anybody advice, but I'll do it anyway. Take what you learn here in the two years or so that you spend here and get back in the fight. Because this country, in my opinion, is losing its edge. We need hardworking, young, intelligent people that will go out there and make a difference. So. I am, and, and pardon my dry mouth, I'm, I'm on the tail end of a, of a cold, but I'm going to stand here and, and hopefully answer. I spent 15 minutes with the New York media this morning, so I am broken in, <laughs> broken up. Uh, you got me right where you want me, so I will do my best to, to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you. Um, Mr. Steinbrenner, uh, yes. my name is Kenny Trago. I'm in the traditional MBA program, uh, and uh, I promise I will not ask any questions about Tanaka's posting fee or anything like that. I know how to answer those, though. That's okay. <laughs> Very vaguely. Well, I heard he might not be available now, so we'll, we'll see. Um, you're right. But my question is, you've always referred to yourself as a, as a numbers guy, as a finance geek. And you've transitioned into this business, which is very much about uh, human capital. It's very much uh, working under these constraints that are very difficult, very strong union, uh, the strong, probably the strongest union around. Uh, and it's also very much uh, within these rules that are not typical business-oriented rules in terms of revenue sharing. and How have you transitioned? What have, how, what have you done to acclimate yourself into that process and to become a better leader for your organization? Well, I took over this role, I guess, in the, uh, the fall, winter of, of 08. But I've been around since 91. When I graduated from college in 91, the first thing I did was, was move to New York and work at the stadium. It was a difficult time. My dad was out of baseball for two years and not really allowed to be involved. But you know, I went around and learned from every single department how everything works. So I, I gained a pretty good understanding of the unions, and that was even before revenue sharing, but I was around for all those meetings, the owners' meetings, when they finally approved a revenue sharing plan. So it, it's, not really, it's not really new to me. 
some of it's a little bit aggravating, but um, you know, we, revenue sharing is a great thing. We've always voted yes and we've always supported it because we believe that there should be more equity in the game, but it can't be two or three teams responsible for two thirds of the money that gets paid out. That's just, that's not right. So at times it, it, it's a bit aggravating, but uh, I feel that we definitely do for, for the other clubs as much as any other club does for the other clubs as far as our ticket sales that we sell and the merchandise we sell and the revenue sharing we pay. So, but to get to your question, I, it wasn't a big transition. The biggest transition for me was George Steinbrenner is no longer running the Yankees, Hal Steinbrenner is. That was the big transition. Particularly when we had, as I said, employees that have been there 30, 35 years, some of them. So, I don't know if I answered that, but. Good evening, Mr. Steinbrenner. How are you? I'm Brent Allison, I'm a two year student. I'm a lifelong Yankee fan, so this, thank you for thank being you. here. It's such, a, such an honor. Absolutely. Great um, to be here. I guess when it comes down to it, uh, the balance, you run a billion dollar enterprise, you've got 27 world championships. Your focus when trying to decide whether to sign, re sign a player, do you really focus on the end product, the, the product on the field, or do you worry about something like economic value? We learn a lot about, you know, what something can bring to the final product. And I'm curious where your focus is when you and Cash and the rest of the team sit down and try to decide. You know, Jeter, end of his career, do we bring yeah. him back? You know, what goes into a decision like that? Cashman's job, and I make it clear to him, is to focus on the baseball. What does this player bring to the team? You know, his age, his abilities, what are his strengths, what are his weaknesses? That's his job. So he has the things that keep him up at night, as I tell him. I have his things that keep me up at night and a lot of other people's things. So my job is to focus on the whole thing from 40,000 feet. So I do, I do, you know, worry about the S network and what, what, a, what a move that's either made or not made, may do to ratings. I worry about what it, it does to attendance. I worry about how our fans will react to it. So I have to worry about everything. That, that's my job, for better or for worse. So I'm at 40,000 feet, but as far as Cashman, I just want him focused on, you know, what, you know, Derek Jeter is a great example. I mean, we don't know what we're gonna get out of Derek this year. You know, he's 39 years old, and going on 40, and this is a very serious injury. And if anybody comes back from it, it'll be him. Because he's all heart, but uh, it's a difficult situation. But there was, there was no way we weren't going to have him back and try because he means a lot to our fans and he means a lot to the organization and to us. So I guess the answer to the question would be, I got to look at everything. <laughs> That's my job. No, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Right. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm from the Working Professional MBA program. Hey, Mark. And I guess uh, I'd like to start off by saying thank you to your family for the donation to the Steinbrenner Band Hall. Um, I'm a UF musician alumnus, and that really is meaningful to me for the promotion of the music programs. Uh, my question to you is, you mentioned before that you consult your upper management a lot for the decisions. How much does that factor into the final decision making when um, making decisions for the Yankees, being a ho the CEO of the hotel chain? I, I'm sorry, can you just repeat the, the last sentence oh, there? sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, when it comes to management, of the hotel chain and also for the Yankees. Right. For your decision making, how much do, do you weigh the, the, I guess, the comments and feedback from your upper management team when it comes to the final decision? Well, I, I weigh heavily upon them because as I've said, a lot of them have been, have been here longer than I have. Um, I like to take as much time as I possibly can to make a decision. That, that's the bottom line with me. So my dad was certainly a different personality than me and, and other owners have different personalities than me. You know, there, there's some owners that will go and just start firing department heads if things aren't going the right way. I want to look and see if I need to make a change at the head of the department, but I also want to look at everything else that goes on below the guy, process and personnel, to make, which is kind of what we did with our player development this year because everybody knows we've been having difficulties, and, you know, make a decision using as much information as I can get and as many opinions as I can get. Mr. Steinbrenner, my name is Haley Dilling. I'm a two year MBA. Could you, you mentioned that this morning you were talking to the New York news media. Could you talk more about your relationship with the news media in New York and the rest of the city? You know, it's, New York is like, unlike any other place. I mean, it, it, we had the owners meetings in Orlando. We have them four times a year, different places. Uh, out of the group of media that's always loitering around the lobby, you can bet that probably eight, 75, 80% of them are from New York. You know, and there's 30, 30 teams. That's the way it is. Uh, a lot of different newspapers, a lot of different writers. Uh, I think they serve an incredibly, obviously, purposeful um, job, which is to keep our fans informed. And whether it's opinion or whether it's just stating what happened in the game. The beat writers are all great guys. They're the guys you interact with the most. They travel with the team on the plane. They're going to every game and they're writing about the game. And then, of course, you've got the columnists who are 
Their job is to, to uh, opine, I guess would be the word, on, on any given situation. But uh, through the years, I've gotten to know some of them. Uh, I've known a couple of them since 91. Um, but you know, they're good guys, but it, they're, they're competing against each other. And you know, there's a little bit of, of drama involved. And you don't sell newspapers without drama. I think it's safe to say. But uh, they're good guys, and, and they're trying to do their job, which is to keep our fans informed and enthused. Yes, thank you. My name is Jamie Kraft. I'm the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship here at the University of Florida. I'm curious on the, the hoteling side, if you have any insights as to where the growth is coming uh, globally uh, in terms of investment. I wish I did, but I, we have, what we have is uh, six mid-scale hotels in Florida. Jacksonville, Sarasota, and then three in Ocala, right down the road. So I'm probably not the best guy to, uh, I'm, not, I'm not J.W. Marriott, that's for sure. I'm probably not the best guy to ask that question, but there's no doubt certain areas of the country are doing better than others. New York City's doing great. Um, I just don't think Florida, whether it's from a corporate standpoint or a transient leisure traveler standpoint, is, is back yet. And we see, that, we see that pretty clearly through the six that we have. It's a small microcosm, of course, of what's going on out there, but I've always found it to be a good indicator overall. But globally, I'm afraid I'm just not, uh, I'm not your guy. So I'm not qualified for that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Robin. Um, and my question is about entrepreneurship. Um, what major trends do you see going forward in business? And do you think that they'll make it easier or more difficult to, to serve in an entrepreneurial type of role? John, I thought you said this was going to be easier than the New York media. <laughs> Boy, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah, I feel like I'm being tested now. That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, again, I, if I'm not a, in a position to answer a question intelligently, I'm probably not going to do it. Um, I'm afraid I'm not an entrepreneur. I am not the most creative guy. I'm, I'm probably more of a manager. I, I, you know, it's just, uh, that's just my personality, and that's, that's what I'm good at. Uh, I wish I was more creative, but I'm not. Um, there's certainly a lot of things going on in the, in the business world, and uh, technology, of course, is the, the biggest thing. And, um, you know, I'm on the board of BAM, Baseball Advanced Media, which is an MLB company. And just sitting through the board meetings, it's amazing to me, technology-wise, what, what's going on, the different ways we're now getting in this microcosm the game of baseball to, to our fans. I mean, it's so different than even five years ago with tablets and TV everywhere and all that. So I'm sure technology is going to play a big part in, in any change that happens, but uh, I'm just the wrong guy to ask that question to. But it's a good question. It's a good question. Sir, uh, Chip Darcy, Masters of International Business. Uh, having read up on you prior to you coming, you'd mentioned being socially giving back to the community, and you're on the Board of Trustees for the Boys and Girls Club. So I'm curious what you do. Uh, how involved are you with the Boys and Girls Club in general and what you do for them? Well, I'm, a, I'm the chairman of the uh, foundation board, so in, in Tampa, where I live, we have the, the big board, which controls the operating budgets and everything for the club, and then you have the foundation board, and it's our job to, to raise money, whether it's through planned gifts when somebody passes away or whether it's, you know, donations right then and there. Not so much to go to the operations of the clubs on that given day, although we do 10 to 15% of what we raise every year goes to operations, but basically to build an endowment, I guess is the way you could look at it. So that's my job. Um, I've been uh, chairman for three or four years now. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand down simply because between work and family, I just feel right now that it's not, getting, it's not getting the amount of time it deserves, the position from me. But we will always be involved. We've been involved for 25 years in Tampa Bay. Um, great things happen at those clubs. You know, a lot of people think it's just kids getting off the street to go play sports, but there's a lot of academic programs, health and nutrition programs, leadership, community leadership programs, uh, great stuff. We're, we're, we're really building fine, good young men and women there. And we'll always be proud of it in my family, and we'll always be a part of it. Hi, I'm Devin Gramey. I'm in the two-year MBA program. Um, I'm curious, growing up in the, the family business that you did, obviously there was an opportunity for you to stay involved. At what point did you know that you wanted to be involved? Um, and knowing that you would have some big shoes to fill if you decide to go kind of all the way with it, what did you do to prepare and what was kind of the most formative or important maybe chunk or experience of your life in order to, to get ready for that? Well, there was a lot of years where I really focused on the hotels. That's what I loved. I loved from the ground up building, constructing, managing the hotels. But even though that's what I was doing for a good 10 years, once I got out of, out of here, out of Florida, 
my offices were at you know one Steinbrenner Drive in Tampa at, at the stadium where we, we were spring training. So I could be in, in the middle of a hotel meeting doing something, and I get a call from my dad, get you know get down here now. You know, so I learned a lot from him. There was no, I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to try to go learn. That's for sure. I, I would get, I would get pulled into a lot of different kinds of meetings, uh, and I learned a lot. And uh, he was the right guy to, to learn from. So, but I, I guess you could say again, people see because I took over the position five years ago, they think that I just got involved five years ago, but that, that's not the case. It's been 20 for the most part. Hi, um, my name's Caroline. Is this thing on? Yeah? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, my name's Carolina. I'm doing the uh, Master's of Science in Entrepreneurship. And my question's regarding your decision-making uh, process. Um, it seems like you like to go ahead and just figure out all of the all the options and then make an educated decision. Have there ever been times in your career that waiting too long has almost hurt you? And if so, do you have someone that is more who is stronger when it comes to like the snap decision making? And do you guys collaborate? Yeah, our president, Randy Levine, who's, who's been with us for, for a long time, he was deputy mayor of New York City for a number of years under Giuliani. I mean, great, intelligent, really tough New Yorker. Um, I will make a decision as quickly as I need to. I, I, my hobby is flying. I'm a pilot. So sometimes you, you don't have, you have to make decisions like that. So I'm perfectly willing to do that. I would prefer to take as much time as I could. Uh, I'm sure there have been times when I've probably taken too much time. Maybe, maybe as I think about it, maybe I could think of a player that, that ended up, we ended up not getting because I, we just couldn't decide. But if, if I'm struggling with a decision, if I'm struggling with what to do, uh, Randy's a great guy to, to go and ask, and uh, he's, he's, he's quick on his feet. So I never have to worry about that. Hi, my name is Joseph Miller. I'm a traditional MBA student here at the University of Florida, and I grew up just down the road in Ocala. And I grew up knowing that your father owned a, a horse farm in Ocala. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if you sp have spent much time in the area and if that decision factored into you choosing UFMBA in any way. I do. Uh, I do. So one of my hobbies is flying. The other is target shooting. I do a lot of 1,000-yard long-distance target shooting. And we're very blessed to have some property out where the cattle is that I can, I can do distances like that. So I've loved spending time in Ocala for, for my whole life. So it absolutely was. It was great. Uh, I always wanted to be a Gator. I always wanted to go to a bigger school. William, Williams, where I went, was 2,000 people, undergrad, no graduate. Um, so it, it all fit. But I've been a Gator fan my whole life. I always wanted to go here. But the fact that it was 35 minutes from Ocala was great. I mean, many weekends I would be there, hanging out with my friends, you know, fellow students. And it was, it was good. It was a good two years. Thank you. Yeah. How you doing, sir? Uh, my name is Houston Bailey. I'm in the first year MBA program. Um, question, you mentioned about getting back into the fight after graduation, and there's a lot of interest uh, within, the, within the program, I'm sure elsewhere, about uh, rejoining the fight in the, in the world of sports. Um, what's your advice for, for individuals at the NBA level? Where, where should we look as far as getting our, our foot in the door in the sports world without taking too many steps back, uh, considering you know, we are in the NBA program currently? Well, I guess it depends on, first of all, what your, what your, uh, what your degree is in. Mine was in finance, but I mean, obviously, they have marketing, management, correct, still, and probably more than, than we did even when I was here. Um, look, I, I never mind, quite frankly, when somebody uh, grabs me at a baseball game or, or sends me a, a letter in the mail saying I'm a, I'm a student at University of Florida, you know, or University of wherever. I um, really like to work for your organization, um, you know, and sends me their credentials. I mean, I, I, I never mind that. Uh, maybe maybe some people like me would find that irritating. I don't. Um, I, I, no ask, no get. I guess I guess would would be the first thing of the advice which I learned from my president Randy Levine up in New York. No ask, no get. So um, you know I, I never want to be overly aggressive in life. I guess, but you're going to have to be aggressive to a certain point, right? And um, I wouldn't confine yourself to one sport. Obviously, I mean sports is sports. Uh, there's a lot of great ones. And uh, they're all different, and uh, there's opportunities in every one, I mean, without a doubt. Hello, I'm Ann Angel Hart. I'm in the Executive MBA program, and I have a question about the YES Network. I was wondering, in the, do you see in the next three to five years the YES Network offering more original content for um, the yeah. network, or do you plan to continue in the sort of ESPN competitive mode? 
Well, one of the things we just did last year is, is do a deal with Fox. So Fox, Fox is, we basically own Yankee Global Enterprises, owns about a third of Yes. And Goldman Sachs, who really did the initial funding to start the network, uh, owned about a third. And then we had other partners who were in there too. So Fox came in, and they are now going to end up owning 80% of the network. So all of our partners, Goldman's getting out, Providence is getting out, the partners are getting out. It was a two-phase thing. We've already done phase one. And we will end up owning 20% and they will end up owning 80, and they know sports programming, without a doubt. So I think we've done a good job. I'm proud of some of the shows like Center Stage that we have, but there's no doubt we could be better. And when you, when you bring people like, like Fox Sports from the West Coast uh, in, into the mix, they're, uh, they're pretty creative men and women. And uh, the answer to your question is yes. I'm sure, I'm sure it's gonna be a different network three years from now with uh, different types of programming, and we could only get better, is the way I would put it, with, with them as partners. Mrs. <clears throat> Mrs. Stry Steinbrenner, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Prashant. I'm in the MBA program. I recently watched um, Moneyball, and I was uh, really fascinated by how they used uh, data and analytics to yeah. you know, get the best players and do better in their baseball season. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, if and how you use data and analytics at the Yankees organization. Well, we, we do. Uh, sabermetrics, I guess is what they call it. And... Um, I always feel, I'm a, I'm a fairly balanced person, I believe in balance, so I, I don't think you can go completely statistics and be completely uh, objective and, and rule out the subjective side of it, which is scouts with their boots on the ground actually looking at these players, but a combination of both, which is what the A's did a great job at, and, and I think teams like the Cardinals are doing a good job at right now, uh, is, is the best way to go. But to answer your question, we have a whole department uh, under Cashman that is analytics, and these are, all, these are all young men and women right out of college. Uh, much smarter than me, for sure, uh, math being their prior, primary asset. And uh, this is what they do, and it's, it's a whole world now with computer programs and, and applications now, so many different ways to input data and, and the things you get back out of it. Um, so much different than, than 15, 20 years ago, it's, it's not even funny. But it, to answer your question, it's a big part of what we do. It's half of what we do. If I'm going to make a decision about a player, I'm going to talk to the pro scouts, find out what they saw, what they think, subjective. Then I'm going to talk to uh, Mike Fishman, who heads up the analytics department, and, and have him go through the data with me. You know? And it's, a, it's an incredible amount of data. We use both to answer your question. But yes, we very much, uh, and I think all teams at this point are, some more so than others. Thank you. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, Morgan Jones in the traditional MBA program. Uh, so you have the hotel chains, you have the Yankees, two completely different businesses. But can you talk about some maybe similarities you find between the two? Do they ever intertwine with your decisions? Um, like, do you take some some things you've learned in one industry to apply to the different one? How do you go about that? Very simple. The customer's always right. So if the customer's not happy, there there is no business. So you know what our fans think, what's important to them is is very important to us, and it's no different than a than a patron coming into into one of our hotels. I mean, they're they're the boss, so to speak. Without them, there's there's no business. So. That's, uh, that's definitely a very linked parallel between, between the two, probably the most I can think of. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Andrew Holzhauser. I'm in the Masters of International Business program. I was wondering, uh, are you conflicted about the whole salary cap debate in baseball, being both a businessman and a Yankees fan, if, that, if you're for it or against it? You know, I, I kind of roll with the punches, so if, there, if there's going to at some point be a hard salary cap, I'll be fine with it. Um, I'll be fine with it. You know, we should be good enough. This is why the whole 189, and the, probably some of you may know about this, some of you may not, but the whole getting under the 189 this year accomplishes a lot of things. But what I keep telling the media is, why do I have to be over 189 to field a championship caliber team? I shouldn't have to be over 189 million to, to field a championship caliber team if our young kids are, are panning out, if they're contributing. We've had some disappointments the last two years, and they haven't been, and that's, that's a big part of the problem why we didn't make the postseason this year. With all the injuries we had, we just had nobody to come up and help. But to answer your question, you know, that's, uh, that is a, uh, that's a big part of it. Hi, uh, Logan Pardell, two-year uh, MBA. Um, what's your opinion on the state of baseball right now? Um, I know that during the postseason, the NFL regular season was still getting better ratings than 
some of the MLB postseason games. Yeah. Um, what do you think should be done in order to get more fans watching the games? Or, I mean, is it just the state well, of the game? Yeah, yeah. Actually, we, we baseball economics today in our big meeting, we, we talked about a lot of that. Uh, the World Series ratings this year were good, um, better than regular season NFL games for the most part. But you're right, uh, NFL, NFL tends, to, uh, tends to be number one in this country. I think one of the biggest things, and we actually talked about it today, shorten the games. Um, we made some strides in the last few years. The, the average game time was going down, and all of a sudden last year I think it went back up again a bit. I know the commissioner is concerned about that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's concerning. I mean, uh, people in this day and age, they like, they like quick. And a guy, you know, a guy that doesn't even swing at a ball all of a sudden stepping out of the batter's box to adjust 5,000 things yeah. and we hadn't even taken a swing, you know, <coughs> that adds, that adds uh, seconds to, to a game that, that I think most of us agree needs to be, you know, under three hours, if not well under three hours. So that's one thing they're going to continue to work on, for sure. Is there anything in particular that you see being done to, like, a, almost like a pitch clock? Or yeah, they're... they're there are, there are implied rules that have, that have been set, not always totally followed, but anything from a pitching coach is not supposed to be walking out to that mound and walking back. He's supposed to be jogging, period, whether he's 80 years old or 20 years old. So things like that, you know, some guys still don't do it, but a lot of guys do. Um, trying, to, trying to get the pitcher from the time he gets the ball back a certain amount of seconds, same with a batter getting out of the box, but it's really up to the... Uh, up to the umpires to, to enforce, and it's, it's hard. You know, it's hard to do uh, constantly, but they, they, they do a good job overall. But everybody agrees, I think, that there's a little bit more work to be done. I, I, I'm sorry, I just have one more follow-up, yeah. and I'll be done. Because um, uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about instant replay coming in, yeah. and one of the things about it, uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of blown calls, but um, it will add time to the game, most likely. So how do you see that factoring in? Well, I think what you're going to see is, similar to football, there's going to be an X amount of challenges that a manager is going to be able to have, whether it's two, three, four. Um, and I think they're, you know, they're working on getting it down to a system where they don't think it's going to be adding a significant amount of time to the game. It may add from, from the time the manager says he wants to challenge to the time the decisions come, maybe a minute and a half, I think, I think would be something to shoot for probably, and I think that's what they're shooting for, something in that time frame. So we'll see. I mean, they, they tested this in the Arizona Fall League, I believe, and um, some of the games there were no challenges. So you're not going to necessarily get it every game. Mr. Steinbrenner, my name is Spencer. Uh, I'd like to thank you for all you do in the Tampa Bay community. Thank you. I'll never forget Robert Malloy bringing in Derek Jeter for show and tell in first grade. Wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> so what, you went to the academy? Is that? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. Yep. All right. Good. Uh, my question to you was, were you able to keep a straight face when Jay-Z asked for $300 million for it? <laughs> well, he wasn't the one asking for it. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was his agent. He was a very nice guy. Um, we had a meeting with him earlier in the season, and I did keep a straight face. I just simply told him that, we, uh, that, would, uh, you know, that, would, be, that would be a big ask for anybody, uh, from any team. And that's about as specific as I got. But uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. And I can't say much more because I might get in trouble. So. <laughs> uh, hi, Mr. Steinbrenner. Uh, my name is Andrew Carey. I'm uh, doing a combined master's in international business. My question is a lot of professional sports teams now are, you know, building these massive stadiums with, you know, state of the art technology, you know, big venues. Um, a lot of this funding is coming from, you know, public sources, whether it be state governments or municipal governments. And do you think this is a smart investment by these cities and states to put that much money into, you know, into an investment that you know might not you know have that much return for every single citizen. Well, it definitely depends on the community, on the city, and what they feel that asset's going to bring to them. Uh, in New York City, there's obviously a lot going on. We we pay for the debt service of the bonds ourselves. The city does not pay; it did not cost the taxpayers anything. Uh, the city raised the bonds, floated the bonds, but we pay the debt service every year on the bonds. But other cities, sometimes the county or city pays for the whole thing. Sometimes the team pays for half; they pay for half. I mean, I think it's really, I'm not a politician, but I think it's really a function of what, what does it do for you? What do they think it's going to do for you? What does it bring to your community uh, doing that? Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Steinbrenner, hi. Jandy Rosenbaugh, professional NBA, a big Yankees fan. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Um, question about the new Yankees ballpark. Uh, mm -hmm. The old one was obviously an iconic ballpark, yeah. and I, I got a chance to watch a game there. 
Um, can you talk about the transition to the new ballpark and some issues that you dealt with and, uh, and some of the pros of, of the new ball, ballpark? Well, we tried to bring, it's t it was tough, of course, because, you know, 75 years, uh, people love that ballpark, but it, it, was, it was old and we were having a lot of maintenance issues with it, but it was, it was tremendous. But in the view of, of fans, a lot of them were angry at us, quite frankly. So what we tried to do was bring as much of the old stadium and the Yankee tradition to the new ballpark as we could. The outside of the new ballpark actually looks more like the pre-renovated Yankee Stadium of the 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s than, uh, than the stadium we left in 2008 did. Um, we made gate four look exactly the way it looked uh, when, when they opened the gates and Babe Ruth hit the home run the first game. Um, we brought over a museum. Uh, we brought over a lot of, lot of tradition. Uh, the Daily News actually provided us with their entire archives. We have pictures all over the stadium that a lot of which nobody's ever seen before. Just tremendous pictures of, of different Yankees and different points in time. So we tried to bring over the history. There were certainly challenges with, with fans getting used to it. But uh, I think for the most part, at this point, five years later, a lot of them love it. Um, there's more space. There's less crowding. The seats are better. You know, the upper deck, you're not risking your life to try to uh, catch a foul ball. We had a very steep upper deck at the old stadium. I mean, probably the steepest in baseball, and it was a little bit hair-raising to even walk up it, quite frankly. But um, That's where I sat. Yeah, there you go. That's, uh, a few beers, you know, lunging for a foul ball is probably not, you know, probably not the best idea. But... Uh, Anytime you open a facility that's 1.2, 1.3 million square feet, logistically you're gonna have issues, and we had issues with the scoreboard, and we had issues with this and that, but for the most part, nothing major. Uh, the transition from a logistics standpoint, I, I think went very well. But it did take a while for the fans to uh, form up to it, but I think, it's, I think they're getting there. I think they're getting there. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Is Major League Baseball looking to expand? to any locations outside the United States, uh, similar to the NFL and discussions and what? Nothing what that was brought up today. I have, I have not heard anything, I've not heard anything about that. I mean, baseball is an international sport. There's no doubt about it, obviously. Uh, but as far as MLB having teams in other countries, I, I have not heard anything, but I'm probably not the best guy to ask. But uh, no, that does not, wasn't discussed today. It wasn't on the agenda, so to speak. Me again. How are you? Uh, Here we I'm, I'm curious as to, um, you know, with such a, a nationwide organization and as much travel as goes on in as many places as the organization has to be, um, are there any challenges to being headquartered in Tampa, and how did you guys kind of end up in Tampa, and how does that work with managing everybody everywhere? I don't know any different. Um, you know, we're, we're from Cleveland, Ohio, because we were in the shipping business, my, my family, for over 100 years. And uh, we moved down here in, you know, 1974, and my dad uh, had only owned the team a year at that point. So um, we were obviously in Fort Lauderdale for spring training in '96. He brought the team to Tampa, so we've got a beautiful stadium. I'm um, going on 20 years old now, but it's, it's logistically, you know, especially now with technology. I mean, now it's, you guys know technology better than I do, I have no doubt. But um, it's a lot easier than it was 20 years ago to, to have meetings face-to-face -face now, even though you're a thousand miles away from somebody. Um, but it, it, it's worked well. I mean, we have our minor league and player developments here in Tampa, based here, spring training's here. Uh, and then anything having to do with the big club outside of spring training is, is up there. So it's a little bit of travel for me, but it, it always has been. I mean, it's not, it works. It works. Everybody up there is used to it. Everybody down here is used to it. Maybe it's not always ideal, but it's not going to change. Sir, uh, follow on to the gentleman's question about the ratings. I know he had a lot of follow ons, but it made me think of something. Mm -hmm. I'm a lifelong Pirate fan, so we were just happy to be in the dance this year. You had a great year. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question, though, concerning the ratings, I mean, we haven't been there in a while, so I haven't really watched the playoffs in a while. But many of the games were on cable television where, for instance, my dad doesn't have cable, so he couldn't even sit and watch the game at home. Is, do you find that to be a problem with the way the, the metric set up for the playoffs? Because that's when you really want people to be into it, I'd imagine. And the fact that they can't easily and readily watch the game could be a major problem. Yeah, you know, for us, we've always had over a certain amount of games 20, 25 over the air on my nine in New York, and it was on you know, a couple other stations the last 30, 35 years we've gone through. But it was always important to my dad that fans that couldn't afford cable or that don't have cable for whatever reason would still be able to see an X amount of games. So we still do that. Um, you know, that, that's really a question you'd have to email to MLB and, and get, get their response. I mean, there's a reason for everything, um, and there's probably a good reason. But uh, certainly, I. You would want everybody that wants to be able to, to be a part of this great sport and, and watch a game 
be able to do that, but it's not always possible. So, sir, you're, uh, you're head of some pretty high-profile companies, and I believe anybody all over the world would come up and ask you for advice. What piece of advice really stuck with you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, as far as business, I'd have to think about that. I mean, the, the, my dad obviously taught all of us, my siblings, this is a family business. I mean, I've got my brother-in-law, I've got my brother, I've got both of my sisters involved, I mean, you know, on a day-to-day on -day basis. And he taught us a lot of things. Uh, he certainly taught us to be charitable. He certainly taught us that much has been given to us, we're blessed, so much is expected. Um, I think there were a lot of good life lessons. Um, how they carry on into business, quite frankly, is something I've, I've, never, I've never thought about. But um, there's always been a, a, uh, there's always been a uh, priority or a push to, to be honest in business because sooner or later, if you're not, it's going to catch you. And, you know, you're only as good as your reputation. You're only as good as your integrity. So when I'm dealing with people, I try to be as upfront. When I'm dealing with players or agents, I try to be as upfront as I can and honest. So I, I learned that from somewhere, and it would be from my dad. So if anything else comes in here, I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you know. I'll speak out. I'll speak out. I'll ask, e I'll ask an easier one this time. Um, <laughs> um, so you've you brought up charitable, being charitable a, a couple of times. Uh, I grew up in New Orleans, and when I think of charitable in a sports organization, I think of Katrina yeah. and people taking, uh, going to the Superdome. Um, was there anything that your organization was able to do during Hurricane Sandy or just any type of yeah, we, disaster? Yeah, we, we, we did a lot with the Red Cross and with the Salvation Army. These are two organizations, you know, the tsunami in the Philippines. We're going to do something with both of them. Um, and so any, any, type of, any type of disaster like that, those are normally the two organizations we're comfortable with. There's a lot of good organizations doing great things, I'm sure. But we've had a relationship with those two for a long time. So the answer is yes, with Sandy, we, we, we did a lot of that. And we also did things like, like bringing supplies, our employees bringing supplies to Staten Island, uh, where we have a minor league team, um, making trips like that. So I, I was proud of our employees. They did a great job. And they did a lot of it on their own. It didn't come from the top. It came from them. So it was a lot, I think. Just trying to run me again. I apologize. Huge Yankee fan, so Quite all right. a million questions. So uh, we started talking about the stadium, talked about a couple of different things, but you know, there's a constant tension within the Yankees between keeping tradition, being so steeped in tradition, yeah. and kind of moving into the new realm. I know there was a lot of that with the stadium, um, but in general, for example, a player like Brian Wilson who refuses to shave his beard to, to be a Yankee, how do you guys manage that tension between sticking to the brand, sticking to what you are, the Yankees, and, and sort of moving on and maybe experimenting? It comes to two levels. Uh, it comes from the minute a kid gets drafted out of high school or gets drafted out of the Dominican Republic or wherever, Venezuela. The minute they get to Tampa, they're instilled with what we expect from them. Starts with some of the signs I was talking about in our minor league complex. But it, it really starts with the coaching staff and the managers, who a lot of which played for us, a lot of, lot of whom have been around a long time with us. They understand what we expect, and we make these kids understand. that That's one. But when it comes to your example, Brian Wilson or Kevin Euclid, who we just got, or Johnny Damon, I mean, we all remember what Johnny Damon looked like with the Red Sox. Uh, you walked into my office a few days after we signed him, and he, was, he, had, he looked like me. So I, was just, I didn't tell him to do anything. So, I mean, I think a lot of them just know that that's what we expect. And if they don't, it's, it's our players. It's a Derek Jeter that's going to go up to somebody, you know, even, even up here, and tell them, look, you know, we don't, it's not the Yankee way. This is, we don't act like this. You know, we, we don't say those kind of things. There's the right way to do this, and here's what it is. So... The example you used, I, I would probably not even have to be involved. Now, maybe somebody like that wouldn't come, period. But I can tell you, Johnny Damon definitely looked uh, a lot different with the Red Sox than he did with us. And I didn't say a word to him. Uh, nobody in management did, as far as I know. My dad didn't. So. Hi. My name is Chetan. I'm in the Information Systems Operations Management Program. So, so when it comes to leadership, uh, do you see that kind of a trend which has changed in the evolution of the leadership? Like, uh, what was, what, has it been changed in what was there in the 20 years back and what is there now? And if, if you advise any um, piece of advice to the leaders which is emerging in the market today, so what, what, would, be the, what would you give a piece of advice? As, as far as what has changed the last 20 years? Yeah. Whew. What time is it, John? <laughs> 
Man. <laughs> okay, you can that's speak, a, speak that's to the a, beef. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I, guess, I guess my answer would be pathetic if I tried. So, but I, what I will say, what hasn't changed is, is people are still the biggest part of any business you're in. And um, as I said, people's opinions. Um, everybody brings something to the table. And when you're making decisions and you're running a company, the more people you can hear, as far as I'm concerned, the better. And ultimately, it's you who will, who will make the decision. You will be responsible for the decision to your partners and to the banks and the bondholders and whoever else. But I guess uh, I'm not answering your question, but, but I, I will say people will always have been and always will be the most important thing, that, and that's a constant. That, in my opinion, doesn't change. Best I could do. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Thank you. Hello. Hello again. <laughs> well, there are many blessings to a family business. You've got, you've got in siblings, obviously, you have people that you can, you can always trust and rely on. You know they'll always be there for you. Um, they've always got your back. But it can be challenging. I mean, we, we all have siblings, and we've grown up with them, and there's good days, and there's bad days, and there's, there's pluses and minuses to it. Um, their opinions are, are very important to me. And they, you know, they, are, they are not only you know, partners, but they are also owners. And they expect, rightfully so, to, to be heard, to have their opinions heard, and to be a part of decision-making processes. Uh, by virtue of my title, the final decision has to be mine. And uh, I will bear the ultimate responsibility because we only own a portion of this business. It's not just a family business. We have a lot of other partners involved. Um, but it's, look, I, I think it's just some of the stuff we all grow up with. You know, it's, it's certain things we've never agreed on or certain things we've always agreed on. And sometimes they, they, uh, they come out in the workplace. But um, for the most part, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to have your family there, you know, next to you looking out for you and, and making decisions with you. Hello. Hi, hello. I'm Meg, and I'm with the Professional Two Year Program. And you had mentioned taking over in 2008. And um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like taking over during a market recession, and your experiences with that, and some of the challenges, and what you learned from that? Well, I remember uh, the press conference for opening day in '09. The New York media was uh, pretty tough. They were pretty tough on uh, on how the facility looked, how nice it looked. Um, and I remember one of them asking me, you know, how can you, how can you be proud of opening a facility like this in the middle of what's going on right now? And I, and I said, I won't mention names. I, I just said, look, you know, we, we started building this two, three years ago. We, did, we didn't, like, just make this happen to be obnoxious, you know. And I said, quite frankly, the Yankee way, I, I believe, is, is class. I mean, we, we are a classy organization. That's how we see ourselves. So if the place looks too nice, I'm sorry. So the article the next day came out, well, class is out. Nobody cares about class. So it was what it was. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was an, it was an interesting time. It, as far as me taking over, the transition was, uh, was an interesting one. Because like I said, we've had employees that have been there 30 years. Everybody was used to the way my dad did things. My dad and I were similar in some ways, very different in others. And you know, for some of you, if you're going to go into a family business, or you're taking over for somebody in your family, whether it's an uncle, a dad, or whatever, don't push a transition. It, it, it's got a life of its own to a certain extent. You can guide it, you can steer it, but, but don't push it. And, and I was very patient with things. We try to just get people to understand what I expect of them, what, deci what decisions I expect them to make, what decisions I don't expect them to make, because I'm going to make them. And it took, it took a good two or three years. It really did. But I think it's going well now. So. Mr. Steinbrenner, you've spoken a few times about the importance of people and your customers and your fans and those relationships. Can you talk about what the Yankees organization has done historically to maintain good relationships with fans and keep a good pulse on that and maybe some ways that um, that might be shifting or new things you're doing as technology develops and as culture shifts? Yeah, some might say we, we haven't done enough, but, but we certainly try. We've got a lot of programs for, for season ticket holders, and some season ticket holders have been with us a year. Some of them only buy 15, 20 games. Some of them buy all of them. Some of them have been with us 30 years. Um, different programs, like we let their kids come on after a game and run the bases, uh, throw balls in the outfield, do things like that. Um, we're pretty, 
as much as any other club into the technology part of it, trying to keep track of them email-wise. Um, so we, we, we do what we can. Again, some would, would say not enough, but we all realize that without them, we are not. And uh, every year we try to come up with creative ways to give them a little something extra, something a little bit more than, you know, a baseball game. And I think we've made progress the last four or five years. Thank you. Mr. Schreiberner, my name is Austin Stiegel. I'm in the two-year professional MBA. Um, you mentioned people were your greatest asset. What are some of the things that you do or have seen done to really take care of those people and, and just kind of almost develop them? Well, we are, we are a family. That's the way we look at things. So, and my dad was always the same way. I mean, he, he was a notoriously tough boss. Uh, he would, uh, he'd, 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 uh, he'd break you down if he wanted to, and he'd make your uh, day sometimes uh, not, not quite great. But he always cared about the employees, and if all of a sudden somebody would come into his office and say, you know, Mr. Scheinbender, I just want you to know that so-and-so's you know, son is, is you know, not doing well or sick, he'd be the first one to get on the phone and get that kid up to New York to Sloan Kettering or wherever you know, the best was uh, for, for whatever could be going wrong. And, and we do the same thing. I mean, we look after our employees, and maybe it's because we've had and maybe that's why employees of some of ours have been here 30, 40 years. Um, they are our greatest asset. And uh, there's good days and there's bad days. Everybody has them, but we take care of our own. And when we find out one of them's having a problem, we do what we can. And I, I think it's important. I think you have to, because again, without your fans, you are not, but without, without the employees, without the employees and, the, and everything they bring to the table and to keep the organization running for the fans, you are not either. Absolutely.